YouTube channel. My name is Annie. I'm the events coordinator at the Maj at Majors and Quinn, which is an independent bookstore in Minneapolis, Minnesota. If this is your first Majors and Quinn uh, virtual uh, author event, welcome. If it's not, welcome back. We're very pleased to be hosting this conversation between author Tyler J. Kelly and John Anfinson tonight uh, about Tyler's book, Holding Back the River. If you're watching on either Facebook or YouTube, please know that there is a comments or chat function underneath the video. That is how we would love to take your questions at the end of the conversation. So if at any point you have a question for Tyler or John uh, during the broadcast, please write a question down and we'll go through them at the end. But also you can just use it to say hello, let us know where you're watching from, um, let us know what the closest river to you is. Um, and of course we're here in Minneapolis, so uh, the Mississippi River is um, our big focus, and so we'll be hearing some from John. He um, is based here in Minneapolis, and so we'll get to focus on that a bit. Um, also, I will be dropping a link to Majors and Quinn's listing for Holding Back the River into the chat, so if you want to head over to the Majors and Quinn website after the event and check it out, we really appreciate it. We can't do these virtual events without your support of independent bookstores. So we really thank you for taking the time to be here with us tonight and checking out the book on our website. Uh, if you happen to be in the Twin Cities area, Majors and Quinn is open to limited uh, limited capacity browsing. Masks are of course required, but we are open daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. So if you do want to come shop in person, you are welcome to do that. Our booksellers would love to see you. So I am going to introduce our two speakers tonight and then Tyler's going to do a reading and then we'll bring John on and we will have their conversation and then I'll be back at the end of the hour to go through questions. So please allow me to introduce these wonderful speakers. Tyler J. Kelly is a journalist who has written for New York Times, Wall Street Journal and The New Yorker among other publications. Kelly currently teaches at the New School in the Journalism and Design Program. His previous projects include the documentary film Following Seas, co-directed with his wife, Araby Kelly. They live with their son in Brooklyn. And also with us later tonight, we have Dr. John O. Anfinson, who's been researching, writing, and speaking about the Upper Mississippi River for over 30 years. He spent the first half of his federal career with the St. Paul District Corps of Engineers as a historian and cultural resource specialist, and the second half with the Mississippi National River and Recreation Area, a unit of the National Park, Serv Park Service, where he served as superintendent from 2014 to 2020. Um, he is also the author of The River We Have Wrought, A History of the Upper Mississippi, and River of History. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here, and I will be back at the end of the show. Bye. Thanks for joining me, everybody. So first I'll read a short passage, and then um, John and I will talk for a bit. Every minute of every day, rivers like the Mississippi and Ohio are trying to escape their earth and concrete fetters and be free. Though catastrophes are rare, the people who live their lives at this interface between river and levee or river and dam are under permanent pressure. No one felt this way more than Luther Helland, master of Lock and Dam number 52. A compact, stoic 37-year-old, Helland sat in the front steps of a little white frame house that served as his office. The house faced the river in a line with the lock's pump house and several other buildings. A rock-covered <coughs> slope led down to the lock walls, first the 1,200-foot chamber and then the 600-foot chamber. Both chambers had miter gates, two steel leaves that closed to form a V, pushing upstream against the current. Beyond the locks was the dam. All dams, whether designed to control flooding or facilitate navigation, need a way to hold back water and a way to release water. Most modern dams use tainter gates, curved sheets of metal mounted on long radial arms. Tainter gates can be raised and lowered with the push of a button. Helen had no such luck. His was a wicket dam, made up of hundreds of wooden panels standing side to side across the river. If Helen wanted to hold back additional water or let it go, he needed to lower wickets. Nothing in sight was as tall as the river was broad. The lowness of everything beside that wide river made the sky feel close overhead and made the lockmaster look small. The Illinois shore was bluffy, marginally developed, dotted with towns that were losing population. The Kentucky shore was wooded, subject to flooding, good only for hunting. Drivers on the I-24 bridge just to the west could easily miss the most important lock in America. It had been called the umbilical cord of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Louisville District, a remote outpost, chronically underfunded, physically and politically distant from the district's headquarters. Number 52 had changed little since it was built in 1929. It had not been rehabilitated or much maintained for decades. It would be a curious artifact if it weren't so important. 
As lockmaster, Howland was responsible for the facility and for every person, vessel, and load of cargo in the lock's vicinity, responsible for the billions of dollars in goods that passed by here each year, as well as for the operation of countless factories, power plants, farms, chemical plants, and refineries that relied on the Ohio River as a water source or a trade route. By extension, he was responsible for the livelihoods of millions of Americans. But with the lock and dam in such bad shape, the task of keeping everyone safe and happy was becoming untenable. The lock is kept going with all the bubble gum and duct tape we've got left, said Helen. But, he added, we're running out. She's deteriorating so fast it makes it hard to keep up. The concrete walls sat on wooden pilings driven into the sand of the river bottom. Some pilings were so rotten that only the pressure of the river water kept the walls standing. The lock gates operated hydraulically, but the pipes that delivered the fluid were paper thin, leaked frequently, and were almost too fragile to patch. Metal throughout the structure flaked and rusted, concrete crumbled and cleaved, holes and cracks that would have caused any highway bridge to be shut down immediately barely rated attention here. Protective railings had broken off long ago and never been replaced. Many of the lock and dams parts had been manufactured at the on-site blacksmith shop in the days of anvils and mules. Replacements often couldn't be bought at the store. When there was money, parts were custom made. Otherwise, Helen improvised. This is all farmer work, said the lockmaster, who grew up milking cows in rural Wisconsin and Minnesota. On a farm, he explained, you fix everything with a pair of pliers and some wire. Helen liked to work with his hand, liked <coughs> hands, liked the sound of machinery, the hiss of steam, the feel of metal, and the smell of diesel. After high school, he'd spent several years as an army welder and machinist. When he got out of the army, he joined the Corps in Minnesota. After a round of layoffs, he took a job as a prison guard in western Kansas. He found his way back to the Corps, working at a lock near Chicago, then moved to the other end of Illinois with his wife and five kids for the job at Lock and M number 52. Veterans were given preference when the Corps was hiring, and most lockmen had seen combat. The work was considered a relief, maybe even a reward, after the rigors of the armed forces. Not for Helen. This is more stressful than when I was in the military, he said. Since becoming lockmaster, he had suffered two almost heart attacks. His doctor blamed him on stress. Helen worried about his lock every day. In 2015, a family of six drove their pleasure boat over the dam. The boat flipped and four people drowned, including a young girl and her little brother. Number 52 had none of the brutalist towers or overhead cranes that characterize newer dams. Viewed from upstream, the river seemed to stretch on uninterrupted like an infinity pool. Pleasure boats sailed over the top regularly. Somehow, most escaped injury. The lockmaster himself had gone over three times. Once, two boats were working on the dam when a cable holding them in place snapped. In full reverse, Helen's 700, power horse, 700 horsepower boat couldn't outrun the current and was sucked over the waterfall created when the partial dam constricted the powerful river. One lockman in the boat's crew pulled out his cell phone and started dialing. Why are you on the phone? A second yelled. The first replied that he was calling his wife to tell her he loved her. Helen, in the driver's seat of the boat's crane, landed upright on a rock. Mercifully, no one was injured. I really didn't want to go out back. <clears throat> I really didn't want to go back out there ever again, Helen recalled. In the military, if someone dies in an aerial maneuver, the team does a confidence jump afterwards. Helen's supervisor sent him out on another boat to see what had happened. That wasn't a good day, Helen said. There you go. <clears throat> Thanks, Tyler. You know, I think I think your reading touches on many of the key elements of your book. It's per in particular the very personal side of our country's deteriorating infrastructure and the real world consequences it has. You highlight people giving everything, even risking their lives and livelihoods for some aspect of how the country manages its water resources. Now I wanna come back to that in just a little bit, but let me step back quickly here and ask a big picture question. Why, why this book? What, what motivated you to pick this subject matter and write about it? I guess um, it began with uh, a canoe trip down the Mississippi River and I would arrive at a lock and dam, and I would realize that if I pulled a little cord, the lock would operate for my benefit without me having to pay anything. And I was astonished that all this machinery would operate uh, just for me, just for my piddly canoe. And then I went down the river some more, and I came to another dam. And I realized not only was there one of these things, but there were a whole bunch of them. And then the realization eventually dawned on me that you know one entity had proposed and control this entire river by building a dam here, a dam here, a dam here. And then when I realized they had built dams all over the country and proposed to control all these rivers, I was just stunned by the scale of that endeavor, by the hubris, by the ambition. Um, and I just was fascinated from then on. So how far did you make it when you canoed down? Um, <laughs> I went on, I've been on several boat trips down the river. That time, I think I only made it to, uh, to Hastings. Okay. <clears throat> you divide your book into three primary parts, examining <clears throat> some critical locks and dams, which you just read about on the Ohio River, levees and floods on the Missouri and Mississippi rivers, 
and sediment issues on both those rivers and in the coastal delta. How do these disparate stories individually and together make your argument that you want to make in this book? Or the arguments, because there's more than one. Sure, um, there are a lot. I guess if you were to sum up the three parts, it would be um, to say that, you know, we built all these structures, um, you know, more than a generation ago, some of them up to a hundred years ago. And at that time we had a certain set of, you know, values that we believed in as a country. We had a certain set of assumptions we made about the climate and the weather. And, um, and I think now we're living with a lot of the decisions that were made several generations ago. And we're not sure if we value the same things. We're not sure, we're pretty sure the climate isn't the same. And so I think all of the things that I looked at in the book, although they're all very different, um, are sort of asking the question, I guess, more so of the reader to, you know, look at what we've built, um, look at the costs and look at the benefits and think about, you know, what we value. And then when we start talking about crumbling infrastructure and what we should do going forward, think about whether we should, you know, rebuild these structures, take these structures down, reimagine these structures um, or what have you. Yeah, maybe just I'll build off that a little bit. <clears throat> Part of what you talk about is um, fortifying and retreating, that some places we should fortify and some places we should retreat from. Um, how is that a part of that conversation? Well, I think when you look, um, <clears throat> that's mostly a flood, I guess, a flood conversation, a coastal conversation. But when you look at um, the projections for sea level rise and increased rainfall due to climate change, you realize that you know a lot of the places that people live now, um, you're not going to be able to live there without either building a big wall around the place, or you know you're going to have to move. And so I think, you know, it points to questions that we're all going to have to think more about. I think going forward, um, the way I phrase it, uh, and another thing I wrote is, um, you know, we're going to have to pay more and get less in return. The alternative is to leave. And there's a community in Louisiana that I focused on. Uh, South Lafouche Parish and a guy named Wendell Kirall. I actually spoke to him on the phone today, uh, who manages the levy district there. And because Louisiana, I mean, they've dealt with so much subsidence and they're going to deal with a lot more sea level rise. You know, they've faced a lot of these decisions that I think places like, you know, New York and Miami haven't had to face yet, but will, you know, where this guy, Wendell, his family has moved twice already, fleeing barrier islands on the coast, moving inland fleeing you know um this other settlement moving even farther inland and then finally in the 1960s they decided okay we're going to make a last stand and they built a levee around these four towns um but they left out this other town called leeville where wendell's grandparents grew up so you know they made the decision you know we have this much money we can build this much protection these are the settlements we have to abandon um the population agreed to raise their taxes i think uh 50% increase in property tax, 1% sales tax increase. And, um, you know, they, they made that decision as a community. These are the areas we can afford to protect. This is the level of protection we can afford. And they did it and it works. You know, <clears throat> that fits perfectly with the next question I was going to ask. It actually builds into it because he was one of the people I wanted to bring up. But, you know, one of the most compelling aspects of your book is your use of personal interviews to demonstrate real world struggles with nature, competing interests, and frankly, the broken infrastructure. I I'm amazed at how you wove together these very personal stories with very, you know, difficult stories of, of, you know, something more like I would write about as a historian of the development of infrastructure, the development of logs and dams, but you do it in a personal way. And I think one of the, the most powerful stories you had was of Tuan Robinson, you know, and, and Pinhook, Missouri and, it, and it's getting flooded. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> that was one of the most, probably the most single compelling story I came across um, in all of my reporting. And so just to give a little background, uh, in South Mis East, excuse me, Southeast Missouri, there's this thing called the Birds Point New Madrid Floodway. And it's 130,000 acres of land that the Army Corps deliberately floods when the Mississippi is really high, you know, major super floods. It's only happened twice uh, this century. So during the period when, you know, it had flooded in 37 and it flooded in 2011. So there's 60 years when it was, it had never flooded. So during that period, um, a guy named Jim Robinson and four other black men moved from Tennessee to uh, 
within the spillway. They purchased land there and they created a town called Pinhook. Um, and it was really, I think, I never saw it before it was destroyed, but everyone says it was a really nice place to live. They owned their own land. They farmed the land right around their doorstep. Everyone had homes, you know, within shouting distance of one another. And it was sort of a very small town, maybe 50, 20 people over the years. Um, and so what happened in 2011, Deborah Robinson Tarver, who's Twan's sister, tells the story that she found out on Facebook that the Corps was gonna blow the levee. Um, she may have heard it on the radio. She's, she's not 100% certain, but what she is certain of is that no one from the state, FEMA, core, anyone ever told her, hey, you know, your home and your entire community is an imminent threat of destruction. So she felt, you know, really um, upset about that. She called her sister, she called her mother. They rushed to move all their belongings. I think they had about 24 hours to move, you know, dozen homes and they didn't get everything. Uh, and then I think Tuan was able to come back the following morning and get a few things, although she told me that she left her briefcase uh, with her social security card on the table. She said, you know, you're thinking, but you're not, you're, you're just remote controlling, I think is the, is the quote. And then once she left that morning, there were National Guard checkpoints on the levee and they weren't able to get back in. Um, the Corps blew the levees uh, May 2nd, 2011, obliterated their town completely, um, ripped the walls down, destroyed the houses. And um, it took seven years for the people of Pinhook to get some money, um, not a lot, from the federal government to build, um, I believe, nine new homes nearby. But I mean, throughout, I think, for the people of Pinhook, it's not so much, and I don't really want to speak for them, but based on what they've told me, it's not so much that they mind that you know their settlement was ostensibly sacrificed for some greater good but that they really feel like they were not communicated with and they were not treated respectfully by this largely white power structure within you know the core the farmers the state etc and i asked you know tuan robinson you know was this because of the color of your skin and she said why else um and so they still feel i think really frustrated and upset to this day by how that experience you know, what, what happened? Yeah, and, and yet, so, so I mean, and there's a tough love aspect to this because you do say in your book that, you know, you know, maybe Pinnock shouldn't have been built there. And, and part of it is when you go 60 years without having to blow what's called a fuse plug levy, people get used to living in that. And, and that's part of your argument, I think, is that, you know, those floodways should be passively flooded versus blowing up a levy. And a big difference with Pinhook, as I, read the testimony from um, Tuan's uh, father, he explained that they weren't, when they came up from Tennessee, allowed to buy any other uh, ground in, in the county. So they were only, I think, sold or only available to them was this you know, ground that was essentially forfeit, essentially sacrificial in the floodway. But no, I think it, it, it makes us, it's, it's one of these tough decisions, I guess that we were talking about earlier, is to, manage flood risk, you need to have the water spill onto the land in a controlled way. And so use the floodway is not a bad idea. In fact, you know, most of the hydrologists and scientists I spoke with for my book said, we're going to need more of these floodways. We're going to need to operate them more frequently because, you know, there's more rain, the river's higher more often, there's more risk. And so the question is, you know, how do you create these floodways and how do you relocate communities in a way that honors them? Um, and how do you when you need to relocate, whoever it is, how do you make them whole and sort of make them feel as good about the prospect of relocation as you can? Well, again, you, you played right into my next question. Um, and, and I'd like the audience to think about how they would answer this question before I ask you, or as I'm asking you the question. <clears throat> and so the question is, who learned the most from Hurricane Katrina? and then substantially altered how they approach flooding. I'm curious to see what the audience is thinking. I don't know if anybody wants to put in the chat um, what their answer is. Well, go ahead, Tyler. And then this plays right, into you know, the um, compensation aspect of it as well in planning. <clears throat> I'll give them 30 seconds to think about it. But so what I say in the book is that the Dutch learned the most from Hurricane Katrina, far more than the United States or than New Orleans learned, because um, 
for the Dutch, it really um, forced them, I think, to reimagine their whole flood control philosophy because they had been building, you know, essentially walls to keep the river out for, I don't know, a thousand years or something. And I think with Katrina, they realized that their really, really best in the world flood protection system still wasn't prepared for the extreme weather of the future. You know, in their case, they're talking about storm surges and, and river flooding. And so they, I think, were, you know, really coherently adopted um, this strategy, and they called the project Room for the River, of actually taking levees down, moving people out of the floodplain, giving the river more space. Um, and of course, when you do that, you lower the flood crests for the whole area. So you reduce risk substantially by widening, you know, the amount of width that the river has to flood. Uh, and so, so Hurricane Katrina put into motion the, in, in Holland this whole rethink of their, um, they call it the Delta Works, the Delta Program, you know, their kind of comprehensive flood risk management plan. Of course, Holland's a much smaller country. I think it's, you know, smaller than Louisiana. So they can sort of have an entire national plan, which, you know, we can't really have. But And it, it actually, their approach to it saved them a lot of money versus what was put into New Orleans. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I'm not sure. I think they, they've committed to spend, um, I can't remember, you know, they've committed to spend a lot of money over time um, on their system. But I think if you look, if you would look at the amount of risk that their system, you know, uh, buys down, i.e., you know, in the United States, we talk about 100-year floods, 500-year floods. You know, we say, oh, this levee is 100-year protection. In Holland, they have 1,200-year protection, 10,000-year protection. And what that means is they're protected from a, a storm that has a 1 in 10,000 chance of occurring in any given year. Whereas, you know, a lot of our stuff is, and the New Orleans system is 1 in 100. And so, you know, that's the kind of protection that their infrastructure gives them. And that's the kind of long-term thinking that they're pursuing, which we really are not doing at all. Which is, which is important as, as we think about this quote that I'm gonna read from your book, um, <clears throat> short one. You say that before America rebuilds, America needs to rethink its infrastructure ideology. Without long-term planning, liberated from politics, special interests, and old assumptions, New Deal or Green Deal, will be a colossal waste of resources. Americans are rarely willing to give up something in the near term for a benefit in the long term. Our economic models aren't built this way, nor is our political process. So how does our approach to infrastructure need to change? You know, I'm sure pretty everybody has seen President Biden's push for a big new trillion dollar infrastructure bill. You're saying it's gonna be a total waste unless we take a different approach. How, how do you see that happening? Yeah, I mean, so to, to answer the easy part of that question first, the um, part of that paragraph is in response to this sort of crumbling infrastructure, which is this sort of catchphrase that gets repeated all the time. And to me, the crumbling infrastructure thing, you know, is sort of like what civil engineers and, you know, boosters and people who benefit from pouring concrete like to say, because it implies you need to rebuild everything just as it was, if not, you know, more so and, and bigger. And I, I think that should not be the knee jerk reaction. Um, you know, I think I mentioned this earlier, but, you know, before we rebuild anything, I think we should look at all the structures we have, look at the purposes they serve, see if they still serve the purposes we think they serve, you know, what sets of values and assumptions they reflect, and then, you know, rebuild or take them down um, accordingly. And so there is some, intriguing language in the American Jobs Plan, which is, you know, the Biden document about infrastructure and using the word reimagine. Um, but I think the thing about that plan is it's $2 trillion over 10 years. And the definition of infrastructure has been expanded so greatly. And I think, you know, a lot of the things or all of the things that it's doing are really great, but they're not traditional infrastructure. So if you go and take that plan apart, about 25% of the two trillion is for traditional infrastructure. And so then you've got 500 billion over 10 years 
which is really not that much money. And so I think that's my biggest fear or like concern with the Biden plan is, you know, it's not that much money over a fairly long period of time to solve, you know, attempting to solve a really big problem. And, and in general, when infrastructure gets talked about, waterways are usually the last thing that gets mentioned or they get overlooked entirely. And so I'm, I'm concerned about that too, uh, in terms of the job, American jobs plan. Yeah, one of the things you, you know, going back to Lock and Dam 52 on the Ohio River, you know, it, and it was 53, you are both replaced by the Olmstead Lock now, but, but, you know, part of, I think that's a, your case study of how messed up planning in the core can get <clears throat> with the benefit cost ratio and, and, and various contractors involved. You want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, so, uh, I think there's two, so, you know, I don't think anyone questioned the fact that you needed to build a new lock and dam on the lower Ohio River. This is the busiest um, lock and dam in the United States by tonnage. I think it's 80 million tons moved through here a year. So you need navigation on this stretch of the river, right? Um, and they've known that for a really long time. And so they started building the core, a new dam to replace two old dams. You know, you build it bigger and the pool can stretch farther and you can replace the old dams, which is not a bad idea. And they had done this all up the Ohio already. This was the last one. Um, but it really turned into, I mean, kind of a fiasco with the way the contract was structured and the way the funding was doled out incrementally over time. And um, so it cost $3 billion, $2.9 billion, um, and took about 25 years to complete. So, you know, many multiples over budget, many multiples of the time it was supposed to take. Um, <clears throat> and I try to talk about the cause, the Government Accountability Office, I think points to, in their report, which I consider to be definitive, and so do um, sort of the chief engineers of the Olmsted Project, this focus or obsession with innovation. And um, I don't know, trying to do things differently, trying to do this, never before tested um, construction method called in the wet, which proved, I think, tremendously uh, unnecessarily expensive. Um, so, you know, there's there's projects that's, that we need to build, I think, or projects that we need to uh, upgrade. And then there's how can we build them efficiently, um, you know, intelligently without waste. I mean, you know, that's a, that, that's a bigger problem than I have an answer to really, but. So, so like with Hurricane Katrina and levee failures, it, it seems that blame always falls on the Corps of Engineers. Um, and I certainly saw this when I was working for them. I, I heard was in enough public meetings where people were yelling at the Corps for one thing or another. Um, but you show that there's individuals within the Corps that have amazing insights to many of the critical issues you raise. I'm thinking of Ty Wamsley and others are really innovative thinkers. Um, you know, what's what's stopping them from, from having a, a bigger role or a bigger say maybe? Yeah, I think there are some really brilliant people at the core, really good engineers and, you know, people who are really understand the relationship between structures in the natural environment and how structures influence the natural environment. Um, to me, it's just sort of bureaucratic inertia, um, tradition and, you know, the core likes to blame Congress when you know they are accused of not doing something, and I, I sometimes am skeptical. But overall, I think you know Congress, Congress is intention. So the core can only build what Congress tells them to do, and so that means you know um, when politicians are trading favors and they're marking up a bill, they put this project in this person's district and that project in that person's district, and then the core has to go build these projects once the bill is passed and the funding is allocated. So, you know, it could be a dumb, pointless boondoggle project, but the core has to build it anyways. They have no say in that. Um, and so I think, I think the buck stops with Congress, you know, goes beyond the core. It ultimately does. Um, and so I think if Congress were to ask the core some questions or were to, to say, here's some problems that we identify looking 50, 100, 200 years in the future, why don't you go look for solutions to these problems? then I think the core would be able to bring forth a lot of really innovative answers. But because 
Congress isn't asking, the court, the way that the organization structured, can't volunteer that kind of stuff. So we have people working at high levels in the court who say, you know, we need to rethink this whole, you know, this whole plot project design flood. We need to do a probabilistic analysis. This, you know, this is not safe. Here's the limitations, or it's safe, but it could be safer, or you know, it's good, but it could be better. Um, and and those people just aren't, for whatever reason, they're not being asked the question that then they can provide an answer to to move that um, that inquiry forward. You know, I, I know locks and dams, and I know levees well. The part of your book that was was really intriguing to me um, that I didn't know as well was sediment. And you, and you talk about sediment both, you know, at the Gavin's Point Dam and Lewis and Clark Lake and in the, in the Delta. And, and I thought those were two of the most new and compelling uh, ways to think about river management, coastal management to me. Um, I'd like you to say something about, you know, sediment, maybe in each of those cases and, and how the, there's kind of been this failure to think about the long-term aspect of sediment. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sediment is, is hard to make interesting. And I tried my best <laughs> in the book, but um, one of the guys I interviewed, a really brilliant sediment engineer named Paul Boyd, who works for the Omaha district said, um, you know, the Corps is really good at managing water, but they're managing half the problem. And so obviously, well, maybe it's not obvious. I, it wasn't obvious to me, but with water comes particulates, sediment, clay, silt, sand. So water is carrying material always, right? And so for a long time, I think the core has focused on where to put the water, where to prevent the water from going, not thought very much about where the stuff the water's carrying is going to go. And so I'm just fascinated by this um, example of the dams constructed on the Missouri River in the 1940s massive dams across the entire river. Um, they built six of them. And <clears throat> what I guess no one thought about or no one cared about is the bulk of the sediment that was going into the Mississippi and down to Louisiana, building uh, building Louisiana really um, faster than it could subside, came from the Missouri River. And so when they built those dams, basically you just block off the Missouri River, none of that sediment moves past the dams, the dams trap it. And then all of a sudden, you know, I think there's 60% less sediment in the Mississippi now than there was uh, prior to those dams, something like that. So you get this twofold problem. Both, both problems are massive and really difficult to solve at this point where you have dams um, up on the South Dakota, Nebraska border that are filling up with sediment. Um, I think it was a 25 mile long lake that's now 15 miles long. It's, you know, literally this massive, you know, think of a volume of water being filled with earth, no longer with water. And there are a lot of problems associated with that, raising the water table, flooding farmland, flooding towns, um, flooding portions of the uh, Santee Sioux Reservation, the Ponca uh, Reservation up there. And then on the other hand, in Louisiana, this is case is better known, you know, you no longer have the sediment because of um, the levying of the Mississippi. The sediment is no longer spreading out onto the um, marsh there and building up the land. Um, so, you know, it, it's always been sinking, but up until, you know, 1927 or so, it was um, replenished essentially faster than it could sink. And there's a, a project I talk about um, that just moved on to like a next stage of approval, the mid barataria sediment diversion where the state of Louisiana is actually planning to divert a chunk of the Mississippi River into uh, a wetland called Barataria Bay to try to use the Mississippi to build up land once again. But um, ultimately it's not gonna be enough. And you know, the, the Gulf Coast is subsiding irrevocably. And, and you, again, you get very personal in the stories there about, you know, the, the, the oyster farmers who um, kind of oppose some of these changes because they're really worried about this interface between fresh water and salt water. Yeah, I mean, I think anyone whose livelihood is threatened will oppose the project, and I don't think they can be blamed for doing so. Um, and so, right, when you change the salinity of a body of water, um, Oysters need a certain level of brackishness to survive. When you change the salinity 
flood all that fresh water into this salty bay, um, the oysters will die. And they may reappear somewhere else at you know a different sort of fresh saltwater frontier. But I went out on a boat um, with an oysterman named Mitch Jurisic, and he sh we 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 zoomed around on this wide open shallow bay. And to me, it was sort of just like really boring, just flat water. But Mitch was saying, you know, we're in this bayou now. Now we're turning into this chute. Now we're going into this lake. And he was narrating this geography that was completely absent from, you know, it, it's long, it's gone, it's lost, you know, sank beneath the waves. But in his mind, it's, he still sees it because he remembers all of it the way it used to be. And a lot of the places that he was talking about aren't even on the maps anymore. They've been taken off Noah's charts. And so, you know, he, he's obviously right there with the sort of vanishing coast, um, subsidence, sinking land thing. And then, you know, um, he's also a big time in the oyster industry. So, you know, maybe he'll be fine. He could, maybe he can afford to lose those oysters. I'm not sure. But um, I was just interested in the controversy over that project, you know. Um, and, and one of the, uh, the top people at the state of Louisiana agency that's working on that, Coastal Protection Restoration Authority, put it really well to me. He said, you know, it's not, you can't choose between stasis and a change because it's changing. So the choice is between one change and another change. It's not going to stay the way it was. So if you don't put the fresh water in there, it's going to get saltier. And when you look, you know, obviously landscapes, nature, ecology, geology, things are always changing, right? But um, I thought that was a really interesting way of putting it is, you know, you, you choose between one change and another change. In, in your book, you make an interesting distinction. Um, and I think it's a, a key part of your argument as we think about infrastructure going forward. You make this distinction between resilience and anticipation. Um, and, you know, both are important and, and both come to play, but um, can you just explain that a little bit? Yeah, and I can't take credit. There's a, um, this is from a Dutch um, professor from, I think, Delft University, Hans de Bruin. But what he said, and I picked up this concept and sort of, you know, expanded it a little bit um, unscientifically so, is that anticipation as sort of, I guess, uh, a strategy to defend against disasters works really well when you can accurately anticipate what those disasters are gonna look like. Whereas resilience, um, sort of being more flexible, works well when you cannot predict accurately what's gonna happen in the future. And so to me, obviously, you know, resilience, we've already attached that word to climate change in sort of our lexicon but anticipation seems really to me to be, I think I call it, you know, the ideology of manifest destiny. It's sort of like assuming that, that we can anticipate and block, build walls, protect, you know, seal off, you know, never, never get wet, never, um, you know, never have our defenses penetrated. And so I think as a sort of an ideology, anticipation has really dominated or still dominates um, our approaches to, I guess, you know, protecting ourselves from, from weather. And obviously that's not working very well, right? So we talked more about sort of the room for the river. I think that's more along the lines of um, resilient planning, right? Yeah, um, you, you basically really kind of hit it on the head about the, the, this anticipation is a failed, failed approach in, in many cases. And we need to think about resilience differently. You you also suggest that um, the country really should move to a basin-based approach, like the Tennessee Valley Authority, or the uh, Mississippi River Commission on the Lower Mississippi. Um, you say a basin a basin-based approach supported with an adequate legal framework may be the only way to garner enough public support to reimagine America's rivers. Why do you say that? What's that about? So there's there's two sort of pieces there. Um, one, you know, we talked about these hard decisions about retreating, and I think the only way to accomplish that um, is by gaining a certain critical mass of popular support. Um, you have to get the public on board. You have to get the public buy-in. 
you know, you have to constitute, I guess what I say, a sense of the public good, you know, that's free from kind of the racist and classist um, thinking of the past. Uh, and and I think the, the sort of body, maybe it's like a political body that can get that kind of buy-in needs to have a certain relationship with local or like parochial interest and also be at a certain remove. So I really came to respect this entity, the Mississippi River Commission, which is really old and it's comprised of three civil engineers, three Army Corps generals, and one um, person from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. But they're sort of this, you know, quasi-government body that goes on these tours uh, twice a year up and down the lower Mississippi. And they just talk to people. You can just go up to them and talk to them. They talk to me, you know, all, for hours. Their job is to talk to people. So you're talking to these, you know, two-star generals, admirals, really powerful people that, you know, have a lot of influence and they're there to listen. They're there to talk. And just to more important than what I got out of it, to see the relationship they had with the locals, because um, the same kind of people come to these meetings every time. And, you know, just they they knew the people that ran the levy district. They knew the people that lived, um, you know, in these counties. And so I think and I really believe that when it came time to say, OK, you know, we have to, you know, move this levy back and you guys are going to suffer, but you all are going to benefit. I really think that someone like this guy, Major General Richard Kaiser, who um, I spent some time with, could have made that pitch to people and and been convincing and and had the relationship with them such that you know, they would trust him and go along with that. And so I think on most river systems, we don't have a coherent body that's looking at it from a basin wide level. You know, and again, a basin is the way water drains. And so it's not limited by states or even countries, um, but you know, water that comes in upstream is gonna go downstream. So a basin is the right way to think about water. And so this guy Kaiser was responsible ostensibly for the entire Mississippi basin, uh, which is kind of amazing. And, you know, I've done some reporting on other river systems and you see so much bickering and infighting and disagreement and lawsuits because there is no, you know, basin based system of governance on them. And, and so, it, you know, another thing we have to do is kind of change our narrative of how we think about flooding in particular. Um, you talk about, you know, that we're used to a narrative of, you know, the good fight saving places. And this goes to the retreat and fortify argument. We don't have a narrative for, for leaving places or giving up places. How do we change that, that narrative? Or can we? <laughs> yeah, that's tricky. Um, well, I think just by articulating it, you know, that's the first step, right? So, you know, I think the American ideology, one one guy compared um, compared the, the Olmsted Dam, which we talked about earlier, to the Vietnam War, because they'd chosen this um, innovative so-called construction method, which clearly wasn't working out. But he was like, they had to push on ahead because giving up, admitting defeat, turning around, you know, would have been so bad, you know, politically for their egos, for their careers, um, for their, you know, division or whatever, that they just went ahead with it, you know. And so I think becoming more comfortable with retreat, um, with saying we can no longer live here, um, I guess it's a it's a pragmatism, um, and I know it goes against the grain of a lot of classical American um, ideology and dogma. How to convince people that things have changed, and that you know the prairie that your grandma turned into a farm is time to walk away from it. I'm not sure how to make that case to people, but. You, you talk about that in your book, about the, the people who refuse to accept that argument. And, and, you know, the Missouri River levees being rebuilt after various floods and people just refusing to, to even though it made economic sense, put the levee back, refusing to put the levee, set it back even more. So I, I, Right. I, I mean, the Missouri is really... Go ahead. Go ahead, Tom. No, no. I, I, it was going to take a long time to 
explain the Missouri. The Missouri is the most mismanaged river that I'm that I've ever seen. So once we get into the Missouri, we'll talk for a long time. So good. Well, we'll come back to that if we don't get a lot of questions. Um, so you know, I, I want to encourage people to put questions in the chat because we're coming up to the Q and A session right now. Uh, I think we're going to have Annie come back and join us, um, and I might I might lead into that session. Um, with with kind of a local question, Tyler, um, and you grew up in Minneapolis, so you're, I don't know for how long, but you're familiar with the Twin Cities. Um, you sure. were here for one of the CORE's um, disposition study hearings. Mm -hmm. um, I was born there and I lived there until I was 18. Okay, there you go. So the Corps of Engineers is currently deciding whether it should leave the Upper Sandy Falls Lock since it closed to navigation in 2015. You know, should the dam at St. Anthony Falls fail, the Corps predicts that the river would begin cutting down into its bed to compensate for the 49 foot difference from above the falls to below the falls. You know, and the cost to any infrastructure in or along the river upstream for 30 miles, especially the water supply intakes of Minneapolis and St. Paul would be huge. On the other side of it, as the river eroded its bed, it also sent tons of sediment down river, which would settle in the reservoirs above Locks and Dams two and three and probably accelerate the filling in of Lake Pepin costing, you know, millions in extra dredging. Can you say a bit more about these ideas of, are these realistic scenarios of this, of this um, cutting, head cutting and uh, sediment deposition from it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that, that whole story is very familiar because that's exactly what um, some other engineers did on purpose, i.e., you know, set, ch changing the slope of the river, creating that situation where the river chews up here and distribute sediment down there. They did it in the 1930s on the Mississippi. Um, and the Corps is still now dealing with the ramifications of that decision, uh, which it was probably a mistake. Um, and so I'm, I'm somewhat aware of um, the, the St. Anthony Falls situation. I didn't really study it for my book, but it seems to me the key there just from like a pragmatic standpoint is the, the core would need to find a, a federal interest. And I don't know to what extent water supply is considered, um, you know, in the federal interest or is considered part of the mission uh, of the St. Paul district. And that's probably something, you know, Congress could change if they wanted to. Um, but it seems like, you know, the core is very bound by these parameters, of like what's our mission, what's our authority, da, 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 da. And so obviously it's in the federal interest to keep that, um, that dam from, failing, right? The question is, you know, what's what's the bureaucratic trick to getting that accomplished? And that I don't know. Yeah, there's Annie. <laughs> Hi. I was, you know, I wanted to hear the answer to that last question. Um, we do have a couple questions in the chat. So if you're watching and still haven't put your question in, please do so so we can get to it. Uh, first one is from Henri. How does Hurricane Sandy and the effort to, quote, strengthen the East River Parkway fit in with this, with anything that you've um, learned, Tyler? Yeah, again, I, I'm, I would not consider myself an authority on that um, because I haven't really reported on it firsthand. I've just read some, some papers and articles. But um, it seems to me that the locals in that neighborhood, the Lower East Side, are really upset over the plan to tear up this park, um, build essentially a levee there, and put a new park uh, in place of the old park, which would offer them a lot of flood protection. And so I, um, I guess I would generally think that the flood protection is probably worth more in the long run than doing without a park for a couple of years. Um, I'm, in general, really surprised. I live now in Brooklyn, New York, and I'm really surprised how little New York has built to protect itself against events like Sandy. I mean, next to nothing. Uh, and I think it's just so hard in a city this dense with so many people to get anyone to agree to putting you know, a wall along this shoreline or what have you. And so I, I've read some, um, I forget the name of the entity who's like really against that East River Park thing. And they say that there's a different proposal from maybe the Army Corps of Engineers or a different agency that would give them the same amount of flood risk reduction, but would not be as disruptive. And I, so I can't say, you know, if one is really better than the other or not. All right, thank you. Um, here's one from Steph. 
So how likely do you think it is that we would switch to a resilience-based model of waterway control? We're very deeply entrenched in anticipatory engineering that a complete switch seems like it would be difficult. Have you seen any examples of a midpoint between two philosophies? And what are ways to make our current infrastructure more resilient without taking it down to the studs? Yeah, no, I, that's a good question. So like the, um, the lower Mississippi, just to set up my answer, has this comprehensive flood control plan. I don't know if people are aware of this, where, you know, every single drop of water that enters the Mississippi, you know, from St. Louis down is managed from St. Louis to New Orleans and they know where it's going to go and they know how the, the risk will be spread out, how the floods will be alleviated. So the upper Mississippi from where you all are, um, you know, to St. Louis or about has no such system. And it's really just whoever builds their levee higher in their little tiny area wins. And there's been some, you know, podcasts and other coverage of that levee wars and whatnot. But I've met people from those exact levee districts and they say, I'm willing to let my district flood. I will let the water in. I will keep my levee lower if we can get this comprehensive plan um, plan done. And of course, they're, they're going to get paid. They're going to get compensated. But I was so surprised. I was at this meeting. I took this person's card and they said, I am willing to let my farmland get wet. And that's something you almost never, ever hear a farmer say. And so I think there are people who are willing to be the ones to take the hit, so to speak. But what we need is, you know, basin based leadership to create a comprehensive plan and, you know, to say, okay, you're going to get this much protection, you'll get it here, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think I don't know where that leadership is. Um, and I don't know where sort of the motivation to get all these um, bickering groups to sort of work together. I, I don't know how that could be accomplished. Uh, yeah, so that just made me think of a very minor technical question that, you know, perhaps you or John have happened to have the answer to. If we were able to move to a, like a basin based system, you know, and everyone was, you know, motivated to do that, how many water basins are there in the United States? Like approximately? Oh, I have no idea. I mean, <laughs> I'm just curious. <laughs> So the way that the way the Army Corps of Engineers thinks about it is they look at like the entire Missouri River basin. So every single tributary of the Missouri okay. has its own basin. But if you look at the Missouri basin as a single entity, you know, it stretches from the Rocky Mountains to St. Louis, Saskatchewan to Kansas. So, you know, that's like a really broad area. And so if you were to go look at the large river basins and think of them, I don't know how many there are, but that would be, I, I think that would be maybe doable, but you can't look at like, you know, you can't look at, I'm in, uh, you can't look at the Minnehaha Creek Basin right. you know, and think of that <laughs> as like, let's, let's do a lot of planning on that. You know, you just have to look at the Mississippi Basin, which includes right. the Minnehaha Creek, right? Got it. Yeah. Okay. So there's like major basin there is. Um, we have a question from Kent. Uh, logged in a bit late. Has the 1927 flood and the subsequent influ influence of that event on the effort to control the river been discussed um it's been no it hasn't been discussed um so on the lower mississippi which is what we were just referring to they have this thing called the mississippi river and tributaries project which was a direct response to the 1927 flood and um again it's it's a it's a good system it works um it's the pride of everyone you know who lives uh below st louis and um the envy of everyone who doesn't so uh, I guess, you know, the 27 flood was catastrophic. I think it cost a third of the United States GDP at the time, um, displaced hundreds of thousands of people. But the interesting thing about it from a planning perspective is that because the parochial bickering local interests who prior to the flood, you know, had been standing on the levees with guns trying to shoot the other guy from the levee board across the way, they were just completely wiped out, flattened. And I think that allowed them to say, okay, let's let someone else take charge of this. Because, you know, the, the, the little piece that we were, you know, ready to die to protect just got destroyed. And we cannot, we're, we're broke, we cannot fix it. So I think that allowed 
this sort of base and base layer, which had a federal component and a local component to come through and say, okay, we are going to manage this whole giant thing. We have an idea. We think it's going to work. We put some really smart people to look at it. And they built the system um, in, yeah, 28, and it's still there, and it's pretty good. So, Tyler, let me build on that. I mean, because because they went from a levies only policy to a a very diverse policy. You might want to say something about what changed between 27 and after. Absolutely, and so it really is this room for the river thing. And I mean, they knew it then. Um, nothing's really new, right? But so in this plan for the Mississippi River and Tributaries Project, they included, they originally included, I think, five spillways or floodways, they called different things over the years, but where you would let water out of the river, again, to like manage the risk, to lower the uh, flood um, crest. And so, you know, one of them was Birds Point, New Madrid. Um, there was two that would allow water to flow into the Atchafalaya River, which takes it further, um, west into swamps uh, in Louisiana, one that diverts Mississippi River water into Lake Pontchartrain, you know, which is um, an estuary east of New Orleans. And <clears throat> there was uh, supposed to be one in southern Arkansas, northern Louisiana that never got built. Um, but again, I've talked to experts, some of the smartest people that I've ever met who say that approach is the right approach. We should never have, have backed down and you know allowed that floodway not to be built. Um, we need more floodways like this. So it's sort of a, a, a mixture between you know you defend this area, you allow this area to get wet. Um, great, though. So uh, uh, Nancy has a question about how to how to deal with the dredge spoils in the era of NIMBY. <laughs> Not in my backyard acronym. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm well aware of that acronym. I um, that's probably a more local question than I am qualified to answer. John, do you know about you know way down well, the river the resources? Road. There's a river resources forum for the for the Upper Mississippi that that really looks at dredge placement, um, and and there's big conversations about that. It's very regulated right now on where those go, and so Nancy, if she has a specific case where you know, dredge materials can be put that is creating an issue, you know, that that would be good to know. But that's again, that's the issue of sediment. And mm -hmm. for Minnesota uh, and for the Mississippi River, sediment is a Minnesota River issue, which is where the vast majority of the sediment we send down below Minnesota comes from. Mm. All right. Well, that's all the questions we have so far. Um, Maybe, do you want to uh, talk about the Missouri River for a few <laughs> minutes to get any questions in? Oh, you have to answer that question. <laughs> what was the question? It's, it's, it's so Why is it the most screwed up river you've, you've looked yeah. at? Um, because it's supposed to do eight different things. And so again, speaking to the Corps missions and what the Corps is told to do by Congress, their assignment, so to speak, on the Missouri is impossible. You know, I, I'm still, I can, man, I can, I probably can't list them. Water supply, water quality, um, navigation, flood control, fish and wildlife, um, hydropower, irrigation. That's seven. There's one more. And so basically, these things are in fundamental conflict, um, like endangered species and flood control. So the Corps is getting sued all the time. Um, they're, you know, not doing a great job at flood control. They're not doing a great job at preventing the um, piping plovers from getting washed away. Uh, and at, at the same Navigation. time, the Missouri River. That was the other one. Navigation. The Missouri River has been constricted into this weird, unnatural shoestring um, stacked with these dikes that make the river go super fast and super narrow. It's not dammed, which is odd from someone coming from uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, Iowa used to seeing all these dams. There's no dams in the Missouri. Uh, it's all these dikes. So it's been turned into this really narrow, really fast river that um, doesn't have very much carrying capacity, meaning not much water can stay within the banks of the river because of how it's been engineered. And all the land that used to be in the floodplain is you know, levied off and farmed now. 
So it's just sort of an unwinnable situation, I think, which is why they keep having problems. Tyler, so when you say there's no dams on the Missouri, you mean below Yankton, below Gavin's yes. Point? Yes, I'm sorry, yeah. yeah. Below so there's, there's this huge conflict between the upper basin and the lower basin in terms of, there's about $7 million, I think you said, in navigation, or 7 million tons maybe in navigation, but you have to operate the Gavin's Point Dam. That was why it was built. Right, right. And so Gavin's Point exists to re-regulate the irregular uh, hydropower flows out of Fort Randall solely for the benefit of having consistent navigation downstream. And the economic benefit of that navigation, you know, I, th this is an old number, but $7 million. And, you know, it's very, very little compared to, you know, they spent $800 million building habitats to try to um, encourage these endangered species, which probably um, could have been managed by, if they could have been allowed to control the flows from Gavin's Point and didn't have to worry about navigation, they might not have had to build those $800 million worth of structures, which didn't really work anyways. But yes, I'm sorry, There, there's the undammed portion. I think it's several hundred miles. And then there's the dam portion, several hundred more miles upstream of that. So there's sort of two, you know, well, again, there's a lot of weird things going on in Missouri. <laughs> We'll have a whole other session about just that river. Um, or you can read the book. Um, so yeah, once again, for those of you who are watching uh, this evening, the book is Holding Back the River, The Struggle Against Nature on America's Waterways by Tyler J. Kelly. We're so pleased to have had you here. John, thank you so much for being here with us and offering your um, you know, great perspective on these topics. And thanks everyone for your great questions um, and for tuning in. The link to the book on the Majors and Quinn website is in the, the chat in the comments. So if you wanna head over there, please do so. Also, if there's anyone who was unable to watch with us live this evening, this video does remain available on the Majors and Quinn Facebook page and YouTube channel. Um, so thank you so much for being here and have a wonderful rest of your evening, everyone. Bye. Thank you so much, everybody. And thank you, John and Annie. It was my pleasure. Yeah, it's a great book, great read. <laughs>